Okay, guys, watch. Watch. There's a video on the formation and circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. You got me? Also, hang on. Uh, there's a, a video on uh, the generation of the action potential. Yeah. Um, just so you know, muscle contraction, cardiac muscle contraction and skeletal muscle contraction is identical except that um, skeletal muscle stores the calcium inside it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's why uh, calcium channel blockers don't affect skeletal muscle contraction. And again, remember that uh, skeletal muscle cannot develop an electrical impulse. It can only propagate it. It can only spread it. Right? So you need a nerve, the acetylcholine, say, yeah. Okay. All right. that I put up there and you are straight with it um, that's you're good you got me okay one of the things that I um, I have to do I have to do this okay is um, where people fail in clinical is uh, the health, complex health alterations in third semester. That's where they go into horticulture, right? And the two big things that people don't get are acid-base balance and fluid and electrolytes, right? So if you note, um, the through the entire semester, the big thing was pH, right? Right? Nothing comes before pH. So even though I said I didn't want, I wasn't going to go over it, um, I feel ethically and bound to, to do that. So I explained to you the action potential for a motor nerve, right? So I'm going to explain to you now the effects of uh, high and low calcium and high and low potassium on the nerve. You got me? So I just made an executive decision that you're now going to be responsible for that. Do you understand? And watch, if I didn't have to go over it and you didn't have to know it, I wouldn't. Are you following this? Okay, so I'm going to use this little video here uh, to explain it. All right, hang on. Now remember, when you're talking about hypo and hypercalcemia and kalemia, you're always referring to the levels in the blood. Right, because you can't measure stuff inside a cell. So here we go. The first one I'm going to talk to you about is um, hyperkalemia, high potassium in the blood. So if potassium, oh crud. If potassium is elevated above normal, so you're looking at potassium levels of 5.5 uh, or 6, right? High levels of potassium inactivate sodium leak and voltage-gated channels. Now, if you recall, in the heart, 
sodium leaking in into the SA node, that's what causes it to depolarize. That's what produces a heart rate, right? So what did high levels of potassium do to your heart rate? Well, what does it do? It slows it down. And it slows it down because high levels of potassium in the blood inactivate sodium leak and voltage gated channels. Where do you find sodium leak and voltage gated channels? You find them in the heart and in nerves. Now, in order for a nerve to fire, in order for a nerve to fire, sodium has to leak in. There has to be a stimulus applied to it, right? And sodium will start to leak in. If high levels of potassium block sodium channels, will that nerve fire as frequently? And motor nerves stimulate muscle contraction. So what's going to happen to the ability of this person to contract their muscles? So they will develop muscle weakness. See, yeah. Right? What's going to happen to their mental activity? So they're going to be lethargic. And that can lead to coma. And when your potassium level gets high enough, and we're talking about peripheral nervous system here, you can get what's called um, hyperkalemic induced paralysis. I spell paralysis. Oh, I did it good. Tell me you followed that. Guys, now, the entire semester, I tried to explain to you why, right? If you understand why, you don't have to remember the, all these signs and symptoms. And if you try to remember them, you're going to get them mixed up. Do you understand that? If you know this right here, then you will know the signs and symptoms of high levels of potassium in the blood. Do you follow that? That's why understanding at at least a basic level is important. So observe. Hang on, I'll get it together one day. All right, so we're talking about hyperkalemia. All right. There you go. Fatigue, weakness, muscle paralysis, shortness of breath. Watch. The diaphragms of skeletal muscle. Right? And then their heart rate is going to drop because sodium's not leaking into the heart, so they will become bradycardic. Say yeah, guys. Mm -hmm. This will in low heart up, cardiac, low, low heart rate. Yeah. Brady low, tacky high. Oh, you were just talking out loud. No, I'm trying to figure out how to spell it. Brady, think of uh, Tom Brady. Do you think of Tom Brady, Rachel? No. <laughs> Why not? You're a Packers fan? All right. Be that way. Okay. That uh, is hyperkalemia. Yaba? Okay, here we go. Watch. Watch. If hyperkalemia blocks 
sodium leak and voltage gated channels, and I'm spitballing here, living on a prayer. What do you think hypokalemia does to sodium leak and voltage gated channels? It makes them leakier. Say yes. So if more sodium leaks into the SA node, what's going to happen to their heart rate? It, it goes up. The heart becomes irritable. So in terms of the heart, in terms of the heart, with low potassium, hypokalemia, low potassium. I don't like that color. I like this color. You are going to have an increased heart rate, and you will have increased um, goofy beats. The ventricles will become irritable. And if the potassium level gets low enough, you will have what's called ventricular, that says ventricular, tachycardia. So anytime you see somebody, especially with somebody who has congestive heart failure and they're on Lasix, which we now know depletes the body of potassium, and they start on their EKG having funny little beats, your first priority is to check a potassium. Say yes. So what's going to happen to nerves, right? If more sodium starts leaking in, the nerve will start firing more frequently. Say yes. So they will start getting what's called muscle fasciculations. That's a fancy word for muscle twitching. They'll sit there and twitch. Say yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if your potassium level gets low enough, the nerve will fire so frequently that the muscle won't have time to relax and you will get cramps, tetany. That's why they tell you, oh, if you got leg cramps, maybe eat a banana because your potassium's low. Or put a bar of soap in your bed sheets. Yeah, it's like you put, yeah, if you put like a bar of soap, like Dove or something like that, in your bed sheets, you don't get cramps. Yeah, I'm not making that up. <laughs> Who's got a smartphone? Look it up. Tell, tell me you're with me, you followed this. All right, so they're, watch, generally speaking, when the potassium level low is low, the nervous system becomes more excitable. The heart becomes more excitable. Say yes. All right. Now watch. Now let's talk about hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia, low levels of calcium in the blood, right? Remember, calcium levels 9.5 to 10.5, remember that? That was on quiz number one, I'll never forget that. So low levels of calcium in the blood make sodium leak and voltage gated channels more leakagey and voltageier. Who's following this? So what's going to happen to the number of electrical impulses those nerves send muscles? So they're going to get muscle twitching, fasciculations, say yeah. Their GI tract, right? That'll be stimulated, so they have diarrhea. And I'm willing to bet you, is anyone willing to bet a million dollars that if this doesn't come back and haunt you, I will pay you one million dollars 
Does anybody want to bet? You know how, like, uh, you got to put Neo in the Matrix? When you get over in the clinical, there are things that all nursing instructors love to do. And what they love to do is dick with students when it comes to fluid and electrolytes, right? So this is going to be on there. And when it comes up, I hope you think of me and say, man, I wish I would have paid attention. This is the Chavostek sign. That was the Chavostek sign. Watch. The facial nerve, it, this person is hypocalcemic. He's got, somebody tried to kill him. Right? You see that? He actually had a parathyroid tumor and he had his parathyroid gland removed. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. And because low levels of calcium in the blood make nerves more excitable, by tapping the facial nerve, it causes ipsilateral contraction of the masseter muscle and it will cause the lip to go like that. That's the Chavostek sign. You got me? All right. The other sign is, and I, I showed you this, right? This is the Trousseau sign. So low levels of calcium makes nerves more excitable. Write this down. Hypoxia lack of oxygen and low calcium may, hypocalcemia make nerves more excitable that's because sodium leaks in and the voltage can, j, gated channels become voltage -er. you following so hypoxia and low calcium so by putting a blood pressure cuff on dude's arm you're cutting off the blood flow, arterial blood flow. That will cause hypoxia, and the lack of calcium will produce that carpal pedal spasm. This is called the Trousseau sign. So the Chavostek sign and Trousseau sign are two signs of classic hypocalcemia. Say, yeah. Okay. Hang out. Where is it? Okay. The last one is hypercalcemia. And hypercalcemia, again, is going to do the opposite. Now, these are very, uh, clinically, they're difficult to differentiate based on signs and symptoms, so that's why when someone's exhibiting symptoms of hypo or um, hypercalcemia or hypo or hyperkalemia, you draw electrolytes to determine which is causing it. You got me? So in hypercalcemia, high levels of calcium in the blood, it blocks sodium channels. So what's going to happen to how frequently peripheral motor nerves fire? It's going to go down. So muscular weakness, right? And watch, all nerves of your brain are going to decrease neural activity, right? Because in order for your nerves to fire in your brain, sodium's got to leak in. So brain activity, they will become lethargic, right? They'll actually act like they're drunk. But the only difference here with hypercalcemia is if you recall calcium 
from the blood is what you need to contract the heart. So even though the heart rate slows because of the hypercalcemia, because it's blocking sodium leak and voltage gated channels, because there's calcium leak and voltage gated channels in the heart, more calcium will go into the heart. So the heart rate drops, but the force of contraction of the heart goes up. So these people will be bradycardic but they may in fact have high blood pressure. Tell me you got that. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the biggest differenti uh, differentiating uh, factor between hyper and hypo um, kalemia and calcemia. Now watch. What does high levels of potassium do to heart rate? It slows it, it, slows it down. But it also, because it blocks sodium leak and voltage gated channels, it takes longer for the heart to depolarize. So the heart becomes sluggish. So the force of contraction will be lower and the person's blood pressure will be lower too. Say, yeah. Okay. That's what you do. All right. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm uh, I'm going to talk to you now about the uh, the hormones. Say so, yeah. Mm Okay, as we talked about before, most hormones are proteins, right? And there are basically two classes of hormones found in the body, right? You have um, steroid hormones. And the different, the things that makes them different is they have cholesterol as their base. That's what defines them as a steroid hormone, right? And steroid hormones tend to exert their effect by directly affecting DNA. So what they will do is they will increase um, protein synthesis. They will turn on genes that increase the number of enzymes or decrease it, whatever the hormone does. And then you have um, protein hormones. And these hormones work by binding to cell receptors. And then they activate a secondary messenger, which I'm not going into. So epinephrine, insulin, glucagon, right? They bind to specific receptors on the cell membrane. They activate a uh, secondary messenger system, and then that's going to increase or decrease the activity based on the hormone. Are you with me? Okay. And then, of course, we know... We got gland master P here, right? Now, just so you know, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are directly connected, right? And we know that the pituitary gland is divided into two lobes, the anterior and posterior lobe. And most of the hormones are released from the anterior lobe. The two hormones that are released from the posterior lobe are? Oxytocin. And? Oxytocin and what? Nice. 
And the reason that those two are released from the posterior pituitary is they are directly produced by the H cell. So oxytocin and ADH are produced in the H cell and they then are sent to the posterior pituitary. The remaining hormones are synthesized in the anterior lobe of the pituitary. Who's with me? All right. And remember, and this is very important, hormones take longer to act, but their effects act longer. The nervous system is quick to respond, but its effects are quickly diminished, right? So many of the hormones that you have are used to augment the nervous system. Okay, so the only one that we really need to talk about, um, did I talk to you about growth hormone? Okay, I'll talk to you about growth hormone, but what I wanna do first is um, I wanna explain to you the functions of calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Just so you know, there's videos on calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. They're called calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. All right, so here we go. I haven't used this in a while. What's the goal of the body? <laughs> you know what? I'm going to put that on the final as a question. Right, then you say, hey, I did learn something. Okay, so the goal of the body is to maintain homeostasis. One of the things that has to be tightly controlled is your blood levels of calcium. Blood levels of calcium are tightly controlled because we just learned that if they're not, then bad things happen, right? And remember that the only physiologically active calcium is the calcium that is ionized. Remember that the bulk of the calcium that's in the blood is physiologically inactive because it's bound to albumin. Say yes. Okay. So just like blood sugar where you have insulin and glucagon, when your blood sugar is elevated, insulin's around. When your blood sugar is low, glucagon's around, right? And you never see those two hormones in the blood at the same time. Say yeah. So blood levels of calcium are controlled by two hormones, one being parathyroid hormone and I'm just going to tell you this and I'll explain it. Parathyroid hormone is released when your blood levels of calcium drop. Now I'm spitballing, again, living on a prayer. What do you think parathyroid hormone is going to do? It's going to do what? It's going to increase your blood levels of calcium. Okay? So I'm not going to tell you. You're going to think about it. How could you increase your blood levels of calcium? What? Ooh, ooh, yeah, yes, you could, right? But then you leave bare spots on the albumin. That sucks. Then hydrogen ions combine there. Oh, what does? What does it do? Stop osteoblasts. I don't see. Look. We've been having this conversation now for uh, probably three weeks, right? If you, want, if you want to communicate with me, you have one of two things. Either get a, one of those bullhorns, right, or sit closer. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you either. And do what? Increase the levels of what? The absorption of Right. Watch. Watch. And all you have to do is think about this. What's one way you get calcium into your blood? 
You eat it. You eat it. But what do you need in order to absorb that calcium from the gut? You need vitamin D. So one of the things that parathyroid hormone is going to do is it's going to stimulate the kidney. To make more vitamin D. Say yes. Right? Where do you store 99% of your calcium? In bone. And you learn this in general, and I'll never forget it. It was Wednesday. What's today? Thursday. Watch it. <clears throat> Calcium is stored along with phosphate. And that combination makes up the mineralized portion of bone called hydroxyapatite. What do you think about that, Rachel? <laughs> you don't think anything about it, do you? Good. Watch. And there are two big bone cells. Know this. Bone is metabolically active. It just don't keep you erect. It's doing stuff. Tell me you got that. Just so you know. The calcium and phosphate that make up your skeletal system today, 10 years from now, is completely different calcium and phosphate. So your skeletal system turns over about every 10 years. And for women, once you hit about 30, bone mineralization decreases, right? So usually what you do is like you break down bone, you build bone back up so that the density of your bone and the thickness of your bone remains the same. Tell me you got that. And the strongest, biggest, best hormone that women have to build bone is estrogen. Estrogen stimulates bone building cells. And what do women do at 50 or around there? What? Meta, I heard that. Menopause, so they, their ovaries stop producing estrogen. It goes down to essentially zero. So now you're going to break down bone, but you are not going to build it because you don't have that powerful stimulator. Tell me you got that. So back in the 70s, doctors used to prescribe estrogen replacement therapy, right? So women, I don't want hot flashes. I want to go watch a rugby match. So they would give them S watch. The body does stuff that makes sense. And these women who were taking these hormone replacement therapy were getting uterine, cervical, and ovarian cancer. The rates went up through the roof. That's why they're not prescribed. Rarely are they prescribed. That's why doctors are reluctant to pro, um, uh, give women complete and total hysterectomies for that very reason. So what they did is instead of um, giving them hormone replacement therapies. They came up with drugs like Fosamax and Boniva. You've heard of these? What? Are these the happy patches? Like, they, you know, women from menopause, they have the patches that they stick on and release the hormones. And it's supposed to like, help them with their menopause and everything. Call happy patches? That's what we call them. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't even want to know about that. You got me? What's that? Is she happy? Okay, ready? Watch. There's two types of bone cells in bone. Osteoblasts break down bone. So when you break down bone, you are going to liberate that calcium into the blood to raise your blood levels of calcium. So what do you think 
parathyroid hormone does to osteoblasts. It stimulates it. That's right. So parathyroid hormone stimulates osteoblasts. And it inhibits osteoclasts. Osteoclasts break down bone. Say yes. So that's a second way that you can raise your blood levels of calcium. That is to parathyroid hormone is going to stimulate osteoblasts. Osteoblasts. Right? Okay. You need to get this right. Son of a... What organ is responsible for maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance? <laughs> Thank you. So, the kidney will then increase the reabsorption of calcium. And that is vitamin D dependent. So without vitamin D, you can't reabsorb calcium. And what's really important, and clinically speaking, is there is an inverse relationship between calcium and what's this? Phosphate. So when calcium is reabsorbed, phosphate is secreted. Tell me you got that. And all three of these things, the activation of vitamin D to increase calcium absorption from the gut, that's going to raise your blood or your uh, blood level of calcium, stimulating osteoblasts, breaking down the calcium that's stored in bone to liberate it into the blood, that will stimulate, and the reabsorption of calcium from um, the renal tubules. And that uh, occurs in the distal convoluted tubules. So here we go. Watch. Your thyroid gland and embedded in your thyroid gland are four small glands that, watch it, are around the thyroid gland. So this is where parathyroid hormone is released. And you're not going to believe this. Anyone who believes this, this is new, so I'm going to take this very, very slowly. You have parathyroid gland cells. How does the parathyroid gland cell know that your blood levels of calcium are low? There's calcium receptors embedded in there. And when less calcium is bound to those receptors because your blood level of calcium is low, parathyroid gland cells release parathyroid hormone into the blood. And its primary impact is on the kidney and the bones. It's going to activate vitamin D. It's going to increase the reabsorption of calcium into the blood. And it's going to stimulate osteoblasts to break down bone. Say yes. That's parathyroid hormone. <coughs> the opposite of parathyroid hormone is, anybody? Calcitonin. Calcitonin. Calcitonin is released from um, parafollicular cells within the thyroid gland. Oh! No, they're released from uh, thyroid gland cells. Okay? And calcitonin is released when your blood levels of calcium are elevated. Again, spitballing here, so what do you think they're going to do? What do you think calcitonin is going to do? No, just generally, what do you think it's going to do? 
is going to lower the levels of calcium in your blood. So just like parathyroid hormone, it is going to inhibit vitamin D production. Got me? Also, with calcitonin around, do you want to be breaking down bone and dumping that calcium into the blood when your uh, calcium levels are already high? So you are going to stimulate osteoclasts. Oh, you know what? I did that wrong. It's going to stimulate I know. I did it wrong. I'm sorry. Let's just see the looks I'm getting. Do you write in pencil? One day, I hope that you... You know what? Watch. This is how we'll do it to make sure I never make that mistake again. Parathyroid hormone is released when your blood levels of calcium are low. When blood levels of calcium drop, parathyroid hormones released. The primary function of parathyroid include stimulating osteoclasts that break down bone, increase the reabsorption of calcium via the kidney tubules, and increase the formation of vitamin D by the kidney, because that's required to absorb calcium from the gut. So that was the mistake. You know, there is something to reading. Yes. Blast build bone. Blast break down bone. Okay, hang on. Calcitonin is a hormone that's released by thyroid, the thyroid gland. Calcitonin's primary function is to help to maintain blood levels of calcium and phosphorus. Specifically, calcitonin is released when blood levels of calcium are elevated. Calcitonin's function, one, bone. Calcitonin prevents the release of calcium into the blood by inhibiting the activity of osteoclasts they yes, and stimulating osteoblasts. Write that down. You don't even have to. It's going to be on a video now. The kidney, calcium, and phosphorus are prevented from being lost in the urine by reabsorption in the kidney tubules. Calcitonin inhibits that. So you excrete that. Should I leave that up? And, and calcitonin is going to inhibit the production or activation of vitamin D by the kidney. Say, yeah. That's calcitonin. Okay. All right. Human growth hormone. Human growth hormone makes humans grow. Are you writing that down? Um, human growth hormone is released from the anterior pituitary. Yeah, it is. I know. If you you didn't read the comment. Yeah. Hang on. Boy, I'm making a lot of mistakes. No, that 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 extra credit thing is got that's going away. All right, what what was the name of the video? Um
Maybe I'll find it this way. Human growth hormone. Oh, yeah, there it is. Growth hormone is released from the anterior lobe. Oh, my bad. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Did you already study it, that it was released from the um, posterior lobe? Yeah, that's okay. Wow. Wow. Uh, I'm sorry about that. It's probably already ingrained in there, huh? Is it? Just so you know, if you get that question and you say uh, posterior, I'll correct you and say, no, it's the anterior. And that won't affect you. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So human growth hormones released from the anterior pituitary. And human growth hormone literally affects every cell of your body. Wait, maybe I got something on that. No, I, I don't. No, I don't. I think that's the that's the only mistake I made on that video. I think. So every cell of your body is affected by human growth hormone. The only, uh, oops, that was a mistake right there. <laughs> Except your brain. And its function is to increase protein synthesis in literally every cell of your body, except your brain. You got me? So in muscle cells, it will increase the amount of actin and myosin in individual muscle cells. So it will build muscle. Right? One of the reasons that athletes take human growth hormone is not so much to build muscle, but rather to increase or decrease the time of repair. So if you're a pitcher and you throw 120 fastballs, at the end of the game, your arm hurts. Ow. So they have to go pitch in another four days. So what they will do is supplement themselves by taking human growth hormone, and that speeds their recovery of those torn muscles. So it doesn't necessarily make you big. It just speeds in recovery. So like Ryan Braun, he was taking human growth hormone. Yeah, it's banned. You can't take it. But the guy who collected his urine... I think he took it home and then put human growth hormone in it. Because Ryan Braun's not the type of individual that would ever do anything like that. That guy is about the biggest penis in the world. You know what? All you got to do is have a couple of good years on steroids and get that huge contract. And then you ambulate home. God bless. Here, here it goes. Watch. It also increases your blood sugar. Yeah. Human growth hormone is released um, in a diurnal pattern, meaning it's released uh, usually around midnight till about 6 a.m. So that's when you grow. 
And there are spurts of human growth hormones supplemented with estrogen and testosterone. That's why kids go through those growth spurts. So they're uh, synergistic in effect. So estrogen and human growth hormone, testosterone and human growth hormone are additive. All right. Um, let me show you this. So during development, um, human growth hormone has its most profound effect on the long bones of the body, right? It will increase the, I better get this right, osteoblasts in what are called the growth plates of the bone. We know about this, yes? Good. So once the growth plates seal, the epiphyseal plates seal, then the bone can't get any longer. But if you still um, have, are exposed to high levels of human growth hormone, the bones get thicker. So once they seal, you, you're not gonna get any taller. That's why giants don't keep getting taller right once they've gone through um, a puberty so for women they usually close at about 17 and for men about uh, 24 so how tall you was at 17 is how tall you is now and for guys that's why they look at it if they're in high school and they're six feet and they weigh 190 pounds they figure by the time they're in college, right, that they'll gain a couple of inches and a couple of pounds. So that's how scouts look at and project those things. Say, yeah. All right. Was there anything else on that video about human growth hormone? Um, sure there was. Cartilage production. Yeah, right. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to stimulate collagen production, and it's going to increase cartilage production that's how it is used as a repair hormone so if you damage cartilage all right what else we got oh yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah so uh, growth hormone um, stimulates uh, the conversion of um, T4 to T3. And as we know, thyroid hormone increases your basal metabolic rate. So that's why human growth hormone, when people are supplemented with it, they will lose weight. What's that? Increases the activity of the immune system. Yeah. Yeah. It makes your immune system a little stronger, too. That's good. All right, that's enough. Okay, what else? Huh? Prolactin. 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 Where's that release from? What did it say? The video cuts off right when you get to the part where you're going to talk about it. About prolactin? Yeah. Well, I'll talk about it now. Okay. All right. So what do what you got to do when um, you pop out a kid? You, right. You got to feed them, right? So when the kid is born, you have high levels of oxytocin. You got me? When the kid pops out, levels of oxytocin begin to drop. As the levels of oxytocin begin to drop, that will stimulate the anterior pituitary 
to release prolactin. Now, oxytocin begins milk production. So you have milk waiting for the kid, right? What prolactin does is it lets milk down into the milk ducts of the breast. They're called alveolar ducts, by the way, because they look like little sacs of alveoli. So when the kid starts uh, going for the breast and yeah, the suckling of that will increase the production of prolactin. So the prolactin levels go through the roof and then milk is ejected. So the primary function of prolactin is simply to um, let down the breast milk into the the ducts, and then prolactin will also stimulate milk production from here on out. And it is the suckling to the breast that will stimulate the anterior pituitary to release the prolactin. And as long as there is a stimulus to the breast, prolactin will be secreted, and that breast will produce breast milk. So if you wanted to, if you had a baby, you could keep producing breast milk all your life, right? And you could have it maybe on like, um, I don't know. Like fruity pebbles. Why do you lose weight? Yeah, it costs about 700 calories per boob um, to make a boob full of milk. So uh, women who want to lose weight post-pregnancy, they're encouraged to breastfeed, or if they don't want to breastfeed, then they're encouraged to pump. Because it's a lot of energy required to make breast milk. So if you want to lose weight, just uh, have a baby and then just keep breastfeeding it. Like, say you gained a couple of pounds, you know, then just start breastfeeding. Sure, why not? Okay. Uh, what What are the other hormones? Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah, don't worry about those. Don't worry about those. Okay, is that it? Okay. All right. Um, this is what I'm going to do. On uh, How many people have looked at that uh, digestion video? Did you? That's sweet. Then you don't even have to come on Tuesday. Why? Okay. Okay. Don't want anything to argue. Okay. So um, the digestion video is up there. I take you all the way from the mouth all the way to the toilet. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday, I'm going to review that. Uh, there's a few things I want to go over um, with it. It's I'm not adding anything. I'm just giving you some more supplemental information uh, about it. And then I'm going to cover the um, uh, reproduction. Say so, yeah. Uh, and that, that will be Tuesday, right? Thursday, we will have a... That following Thursday will be a review, right? Tuesday, take that day to study, and then Thursday will be the final. If you want to take the final early, you can do that. If you want to take it on Tuesday, you can do it. What time on Tuesday? Uh, I don't know. I'll be here at 2 o'clock. Okay. So they can still come in and everything on Tuesday and study and everything? What's that? They'll come in Tuesday and study here? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. You got me? Right? <laughs> so if you want to do that, uh, let Timmy know, and you can uh, absolutely do that. Okay. Are you? Do you plan on coming in on Tuesday? Yeah, I was going to take it Wednesday, I think. We said, okay, then why don't we do this? Why don't uh, after class we'll set up a we'll set up a time. Okay. Is that okay? Does anybody else want to take it early? You want to take it? Okay. We'll set up a time.
there you go. Okay, we're done for today. Okay, guys, you ambulate home now. You study. If you got any questions? Uh, oh, oh, it died again. Hello? Oh, it didn't work again.